the day that Viktor Frankl died uh, was born on the day that Beethoven died. Later on, just give you a little bit of an idea of the type of fellow that he was, um, uh, when he was reflecting upon this and somebody asked him whether he sees any meaning in the fact that he died on the day, he, that he was born on the day Beethoven died, his reaction was, uh, tragedy usually comes in pairs. <laughs> Insofar as when logotherapy started to germinate in his mind, uh, Rabbi Schoenbach is a thousand percent correct. Uh, it did not start with the Shoah. It started when he was in high school. And when he was in high school, he, uh, he had a biology professor, of all things, who was speaking about uh, what defines a human being, uh, reaction formations. He's a, just a question of a biology. And according to uh, the biographies that have come down from Frankel, he apparently got up in the middle of the class uh, in reaction to uh, the reductionist approach that the professor took and said, if that's the case, uh, what is humanity all about? What is the meaning of life? Uh, basically, uh, you're reducing all of us to animals. It doesn't make any sense. So he already was in his own mind at that time thinking about these issues. Uh, in his earlier life, I remember he was living in Vienna, which from at one point in time being a big center became a center of hate. And he became the victim of that hate in a, in a very, uh, I said, a very painful manner. Uh, he was um, the last person to get married according, about, in other words, the Nazis, what they did, Yamach Shimon was, they made it impossible for Jews to get married. He was the last one to get married in Vienna <coughs> through rabbinic auspices. Um, the lady that he married, <coughs> her name was Tilly. Uh, we, uh, we know why he chose her to get married. And that tells you a little bit about even in his younger years, he was a little bit different than the rest. He, um, one day uh, in his uh, home in, in Vienna, he excused himself from a long-awaited lunch by saying that he had to go to a hospital because a patient uh, was in an emergency situation. And, <clears throat> and his wife-to-be, her, her name again is Tilly, um, was obviously a little bit disappointed. He ran away uh, to the hospital as per his dedication, came back a few hours later. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a little bit past lunchtime. And uh, what greeted him was a concerned lady who asked, and how is the patient doing? <laughs> At that point in time, he said, this is the lady I'm going to marry. Because instead of her being concerned about, hey, you're late for lunch, and we've been waiting for you all this time, her focus was on what was going on out there. And uh, I don't know how many people, th this is an Eliezer Rifka thing, right? You know. Uh, the one who's going to feed the camel. Not, uh, no, no narcissistic questions or, or, or desires. Um, in terms of the video that you saw is actually quite fascinating. Um, and it does in a, uh, in a capsule form. And remember that you're going to hear Viktor Frankl with a very heavy uh, accent. But remember that English is not his first language. And it is absolutely astounding looking back how much of a master of the English language he became um, through, uh, through the course of the years. Let me uh, just introduce to you, although you know, this is not uh, Dvar Torah time, but just to give you an idea of, uh, of this through a uh, Torah prism. You have in this week's Torah reading the, the beginning, uh, Vayisrotuzuhabonim Remember this famous posuk? Uh, Rivka is pregnant. Uh, the, uh, there's a contentiousness going on inside her womb. And she says, uh, if that's the case, what am, I, what am I for? You know what she was asking? She was asking, what's the meaning of this? She didn't understand it. Vatelech, she went, Lidrosh Hashem. 
She went to inquire from God. What did God tell her? If this was an issue of I'm in excruciating pain and I got to know what this is all about, the fact that a doctor tells you, well, you have this pain because of that, doesn't take away the pain. Her pain wasn't taken away by that. But the whole problem was that it was not the pain that bothered her, it was what's the meaning of the pain. And when God said to Rivka, what's going on inside you is the prototype of what's going to go on in, in Jewish history, she understood it. Not that the pain went away, but she saw this. God was telling her, this is the meaning of your pain. What you're experiencing now is the travail of your people that are going to come. Now, if you take a look at this, basically a simple little twist. Uh, compliments of Viktor Frankl, who never wrote a peerish on Chomish. But if he had to explain this, this is the way he would do it. And uh, what we're here today to do is to try uh, to uh, get a handle on what is it that this is all about. In other words, there is a system here. It's not, simply speaking, making a, a comment, but there's a philosophy that, that explains what, what this is all about. So let's begin with the background of probably an, a, a hidden enemy that I know came up in, last, in, in the last symposium that we had, which is probably underlining some of the issues that you're going to be discussing today. And that when you speak about this issue of the challenge of living in a life of meaninglessness, um, the most salient example of this is the extraordinarily high rate of depression in our society. Uh, a rate of depression which, according to some at very serious moments, can be one out of five, but in the more, shall we say, benign, but certainly present uh, expressions of depression that maybe even um, double that. We all have these times that we feel you know, why should I? What's it all about? I don't feel like doing this. It is essentially saying, what, what's the purpose in all of this bother that I have? And this is a very serious issue which um, governs a lot of people's thinking. In other words, why, what am I all about? In the end, does it mean anything? Does, is there a difference? A lot of people will say, you know, if, if I leave this world, nobody will even notice. As if to say, my existence has no meaning, not for me and not for anyone else. Which is why one of the most uh, fascinating antidepressants is actually free. If you go over to someone who you, know, you don't know at all, uh, you can make a phenomenal difference. I had last week uh, an, interesting, um, an interesting happenstance. I went... Um, I went to a store to buy uh, earplugs for my flip phone. I'm still in flip phone mode. And uh, they didn't have it in the store that I went to, so they said, go down a little further, and that store does have it. So I complimented them for saying that even though it's your competition, you recommended them, so I went. I went there, and there they actually had exactly what I needed. It was also a Black Friday sale, even though it was Wednesday. I can't figure that one out, but all right. So I didn't complain. On the way back, uh, I realized that between those two stores was my favorite bookstore. So I went to the bookstore. I always go looking for books. And uh, the lady there asked me what I was looking for. And um, she showed me a place where a lot of them were on sale. And um, for some reason or another, we got engaged in conversation. And as I was about to um, leave, I complimented her on her helpfulness and how kind she was. A day later, I get an email. This is an email from a lady which goes as follows. Not Jewish. She said, I don't know how she got my email. I didn't bother asking. Uh, probably it's in the public domain, whatever. So uh, she says, uh, you, you it turns out that she knew me and she searched me out. She saw that I was in the stores, so she made up her mind that she was going to be serving me, which I didn't know at the, at the time, but that's fine. And then she said that she had a particularly rough time because she's trying to hold down two jobs uh, be, because she can't make ends meet and she has to support two kids. And you're telling me uh, that I was kind, made my day. 
And I was so depressed going through the day, but it lifted me up and I was able to go through the entire day. It's nothing to do with me, folks. It's something that we all can do. A little vort that you say to someone, what it does is changes their attitude. They say, somebody really cares about me. I really do matter. Uh, I'm not here for nothing. I do make a difference. These things are beautiful antidepressants. In a sense, what you say is give a person a sense that their life has a meaning because someone else really notices you. Those are small little things that can address it. I'm not suggesting that this is the end of the depression story. It goes much deeper. But when we always have these situations of problems say, what can I do about it? There's a lot you can do about it. Just simple things that make a difference that in our society which has become disjointed um, that people don't care for each other. In case you don't believe me, just watch what happens when you go into an elevator. Uh, this has been noticed by many social psychologists. I an elevator usually has four corners, right? If there's one person in an elevator and then someone else goes into the elevator, you can bet your house that they're going to go into the furthest corner away from the guy who is in the elevator or the lady in the elevator. And if, for whatever reason, they would go and stand right next to the person who's the only person in the elevator, they're going to feel uncomfortable. What's going on here? Why are you hounding me? Why are you standing on top of me? Because this is the way that we are. But I, I try this now, whenever you're going into an elevator, try to make conversation with people in the elevator. It's a tremendously fascinating exercise. It lowers the temperature. It gets people more engaged. And anybody who leaves the elevator after having been spoken to as a person rather than a bump on, uh, on, on a moving machine, they're going to leave and say, thank you, have a nice day, or whatever. It makes a tremendous difference, all of these things that we can do. But today is about Viktor Frankl. And let me begin by, uh, by saying that his philosophy, which was worked out quite nicely, built around one simple little premise. And this is that the striving to find a meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force in the human being. That is it. Get that into your head because that's what it's all about. The primary motivational force in the human being is to find a meaning in one's life. What does it mean to say this is the primary motivational force? We see a lot of people who are obsessed with making money, obsessed with uh, becoming president of the United States or some other power grab. Uh, so how can Frankel, in the face of these things that he must have seen in his own time, how could he say that this is the primary motivational force in the human being? What he would tell you, and which comes out in various places in his writings, is that I, I don't deny that uh, people are obsessed with power. I don't, uh, I don't deny that people are obsessed with wealth. Uh, but I am saying to you that this is not what human beings are hardwired to do. Uh, I'm saying to you that the human being at his or her best is one who strives for meaning. And when they do that, even though necessarily they may not attain the meaning or whatever the case may be, but this is where human action is. And this is where human beings flourish. There's a classic story in terms of his own wealth. Uh, not that he wasn't concerned about it. Obviously, you have to be concerned about it. But the story goes that he was once offered a summer job as a teacher at Harvard University. So that's not a small thing. You know, I don't know how many of us were ever offered that. And days gone by, he was offered 9,000 US dollars for teaching a summer course at Harvard. Uh, that was at the time when 9,000, it probably would be the equivalent of maybe close to $100,000 now. He turned it down. And um, they asked him why he was turning it down. Did he want more money, whatever? He said, no, I didn't turn it down for that. I turned it down for a very simple reason. He said, the only reason why I like to make money 
uh, is because with the money, I'm able to buy the time that I need in order to do the things that I find meaningful. But I already have the time, so I don't need the money. <laughs> do you get it? I mean, people don't think like that. But that's the way he thought. You know, I don't need the money because my focus is, uh, is all good and I don't need it. Insofar as the pursuit of pleasure, he takes an interesting approach, which is more or less, um, and almost everything that he, he says has a parallel in, 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 in the Gomorrah, in, in the Chumash, whatever. I'm not suggesting to you that everything in logotherapy is consistent with Judaism. That would be probably not accurate. But there are so many things that are, and the basic rudiments of the psychology are, are Jewishly oriented. If you take the word meaning and you substitute for it Torah, uh, you have not logotherapy, but logotherapy. And it would work just as well. Uh, but that hopefully may, it may come out over the course of the, last, of, the next, uh, of the next while. So anyway, insofar as the issue of pleasure is concerned, he doesn't say that you shouldn't do it. Uh, but he does say, simply speaking, empirically, anyone who is on a pleasure track, the more they have, the more they want. So it lands up with an existential frustration. So he's not saying you shouldn't do it. He's just saying you make that decision that that's where your orientation is. You're going to be stymied. You're going to be frustrated. So it says what you have here is an, um, an interesting... Um, as, it's an interesting approach, which is not to say I'm not moralizing, I'm not telling you what to do, uh, but I am suggesting to you that if you do this, it's going to work better. Uh, this actually got him a, into a little bit of trouble down the road because as you hear in, in every single film that you have of Viktor Frankl, what comes through is, is his passion when he speaks. So, so you turn him on and um, he believes in this fully. It's almost like he's a preacher a Bible Belt preacher preaching on the idea of meaning. And there were a lot of people over the course of time who resented it. Uh, if you want to have a little bit of a picture in, in terms of where he was, psychologically speaking, on the spectrum, for a long time he was the Donald Trump of psychology. I hate using that as an analogy, but not that he used uh, the foul language of Donald Trump, uh, God forbid, uh, but in the way that people pilloried him. And, and basically m made fun of his ideas, he was really shunned. And th to his credit, he never, he, it bothered him. So I knew him well enough to know that it bothered him. Um, and um, it pained him. Uh, and um, let me uh, just go back to uh, last year, we had a famous in, in, um, incident where a story that I told was actually involved someone who was actually there when it happened. But when he got criticized, and over the course of time I had built a, uh, a, a nice relationship with him, I would sometimes get a call from him saying, what did I do here that was wrong? Uh, because he was really sensitive. He, didn't, he, he knew well enough that for his logotherapy to somehow or other make it in the world, he had to have credibility. So it bothered him no end that he was uh, totally attacked. Um, uh, he, he, sp he spoke about once that he went uh, to Israel and uh, he spoke to a group of psychologists who were, I would say, anti-logotherapy, but pro some other type of psychology. I'll leave it to your imagination, which it was. And then he said the next day he walked out, uh, he took a walk in the desert, and he said he felt more lonely at Hebrew University in the Department of Psychology than he did in the desert because they, they basically not, not ignored him, but, bas but they made Achim Porok from him. Maybe they said, what you're saying is nonsense. Um, so that bothered him uh, immensely because he knew, um, he knew what he needed in order to make it. But what is interesting to note is that it never deterred him from doing what he felt he had to do, so much so that instead of shrinking back and saying, all right, if you want me to moderate, I will, uh, he actually pushed further. So let's take this simple little thing of the striving to find the meaning in life as a primary motivational force in man. It starts building up. Okay, if that's the case, 
So there has to be meaning in the world, right? Because you can strive to find the meaning if there is no meaning. So meaning has to be there. So where is the meaning? And what happens if you try and you look and you don't find the meaning? And then the more, the more profound question is, why is this meaning meaningful if in fact the world is going to end up um, exploding through an atomic bomb? This a la bomb atomique, uh, which was going on in his day, uh, the idea that the world would be destroyed, how can you go talk to people about having a meaning in life when the whole world is going to go to smithereens? It's a very, a very important question. So how do you answer a question like that if you're Viktor Frankl? And you're building your entire system on the idea that, world, that, that the life has meaning. And let's go a little bit further. Life has meaning unconditionally. Unconditionally, that means at any, in, any, in any circumstance, there has to be a meaning. In the depths of the, uh, of the concentration camps, in the worst times, there, there had to be a meaning. We'll get to that in a second. How can you do that? How can you say that? So you know what he does? He basically introduces a phenomenal idea. This very person who was affirmative about the existence of God, about how the world was created with a purpose, um, introduces the idea to people reading his books that there's such a thing as the world to come. Olam Haba. Crazy. Remember, this is the 1960s, 1970s. People thought that anybody who believed in Olam Haba in those days was a loony, was crazy. And he, he doesn't go so far as to um, posit it as a theologian, but he says, may not. In other words, there's a meaning beyond this meaning, which is a meaning in the world beyond this world. He uses this famous analogy, which I think I had shared with you last, last time, of the ape and the serum. And he says, when you, when, you give an, if, when you give an ape a serum to try to find out if it's going to work to cure the common cold or whatever, and then you ask the ape, uh, what's the meaning of this suffering? The ape has no clue. But we who are administering it, we know that there is a meaning to it because that suffering is going to possibly unravel and uh, help us discover what's going to help people with a common cold. So we know that there's a meaning to this ape suffering, but the ape doesn't know it. So, I, so Frankel says, okay, so let's go a little bit further. Maybe that's the way it works with human beings too. We don't know the meaning of our suffering in this world, but maybe in the world beyond this world, the meaning of our suffering will become explicated. And he calls this not meaning on, on its own, he calls this what you call a super meaning, which goes into the next generation. So here this man of phenomenal courage, knowing full well that everybody's watching every word that he says, basically he's here, take this. In other words, if you don't have enough to criticize me about, here's more. But he was stuck, I wouldn't say he was stuck, but he had to do this because that's where the system was going. Um, I remember when I was working on my PhD uh, and I um, engaged him, I was at the San Diego State University where the Logotherapy Institute was at the time. So we had this uh, conversation which became um, uh, a, a official document which he actually signed and which we went back and forth and said, you know what, Th this is, uh, almost like it's, it's religion. And I pushed him to the point of saying, okay, uh, so how do you uh, stop? Uh, and isn't it dangerous that you're really pushing people towards religiosity? And uh, Frankel was very clear, he said he understood the dangers, but he said, we uh, open the door, but we don't push people through, uh, which is very important. Later on, uh, he would get into a tiff with Rollo May on this, and a lot of other people who didn't understand, they were sort of thinking that logotherapy, at least Viktor Frankl vintage, was pushing people uh, rather than, you know, acknowledge their autonomy and presenting things to them for them to choose, and that almost as if they were being denied their choice. 
And uh, so Rollo May basically accused logotherapy of being authoritarian. And um, at that point in time, it's always good to be in the right place in the right time. So <clears throat> I wrote a uh, piece in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology in which I explained why Rollo, Rollo May was wrong. And uh, Viktor Frankl wrote a piece after what I wrote saying uh, why I was right and May, May was wrong. So it was good. It was all good. The, the, there was a happy ending to this because later on in life, Rollo May and Viktor Frankl met. They had a nice exchange, and he gained a, a better appreciation of what he was all about. So in a sense, he, became, he, he created some of this problem because he was so passionate about what he believed in. But he was also a pretty, he, he was a brilliant fellow. And, and he knew exactly what psychology is supposed to do. And he, he stretched the limits because he had this really strong belief that human beings are, are actually fundamentally spiritual beings, not spiritual in the religious sense, but really spiritual in the sense of there being this great differentiation between animals and humans. And that there is a dimensional difference between humans and animals, which by the way, if you think about it today, is one of the major challenges that we have in our generation. Uh, a lot of people today um, it will, if challenged to the quick about who they would save, a relative or a dog, or their dog that was about, that were both in danger, it's astounding how many would vote for the dog. In the 19, was it 1970s, it was Dennis Prager who, uh, who wrote a piece about um, a poll that was taken about high school students, about if you're passing by and there's a human being and, and a dog that are drowning, who would you save? And one third of them said uh, that they would save the dog. That's this generation now that was kids then are now adults. And watch newspapers today when someone does something nasty to a dog. I'm not justifying it, God forbid. But it's more newsworthy to talk about someone who is cruel to a dog than, a, than an axe murderer. Uh, in, in many instances, we say, you know what, people killing people, that we understand. But did you kill, a human, but did you kill an animal? That we don't get. Uh, Viktor Frankl would have had a great problem in our generation uh, with this uh, movement towards thinking of animals as human beings at another level or thinking of them as having as much right to life as, as, as human beings do. But that's sort of a digression just to show you some of the things that, that, that even now as we're studying logotherapy in the 21st century, we find because of the fact that what he, ta what he tapped into was a universal truth that we're not surprised that he speaks even to the types of untruths that are going on in our generation. Uh, so, unconditional meaning, meaning that there's a meaning in this life and that even if there's no meaning in this life, there's a, w a life beyond. So that even if a person, let's say, uh, on the therapeutic level who would not be able to see meaning here, but, but the, uh, introducing the idea of the possibility of an afterlife, a person may reject it. And logotherapy, like any single therapy, does not work for, anyone, for everyone, but it does open up avenues. Now let me go back a little bit. So there is this unconditional meaning, and how do you uh, fulfill it? How do you realize this meaning? You realize this meaning through the choices that you make. Your free will to, uh, as he spoke about it, the will to meaning, uh, and you freely choose through your will, through your exercise of your will, uh, the meaning that uh, you're going to embrace. And the free will is actually something which is very important. Uh, we have a famous statement in the Talmud which says everything is the, in the hands uh, of, uh, of God, everything is the hands of heaven, except for uh, the awe, I hate using the word fear, it says, except for the awe of heaven. Everything is in the hands of heaven except for the awe of heaven. What does that mean? It means, simply speaking, that whether you're going to be rich or poor, you don't have that much to say about it. Whether you're going to be tall or short, you have even less to say about it. Whether you're going to uh, be born in this country or that country, probably you have nothing to say about it. 
lots of things that happen about you. Uh, you don't have cho choice. You don't have the control over it. But you do have control over what type of person you're going to be. A person who is in awe of heaven, who therefore chooses to abide by what God asks us to do, or someone who rejects it. That's your choice. So when somebody, let's say, complains and says, how come I have no say in all this? He said, it's not a big deal. We're not uh, ever put in a position where we have to answer, how come we didn't give a million dollars to Tzedakah because we only made $5,000 a year or whatever? We're not expected to give a million dollars to Tzedakah because we don't have the wherewithal to do it. But if we are blessed with that, then we have to do it. The choices that we make uh, are basically choices within the constraints of uh, what life gives us. Male, female, uh, whatever. Uh, if you're a male and you don't uh, bear children, nobody can say to you, how come you didn't have someone uh, in your womb for nine months? As a male. Um, the idea that we should be frustrated because of that. Take a look at some of the things that are going on in our generation in terms of people's gender identity and all of this. What would Frankl say about all of this? I mean, one of the things that you find in him is this outer orientation. The excessive focus on the self, he tries to switch it off to being uh, putting on the focus on the other. So, um, for example, and we'll, I think there's a, little, uh, there's a video on it Rabbi Schoenbach told me about, the essence of love is moving away from yourself uh, to focus on the other, from me to we, uh, from to from being focused on myself only to going beyond and focusing on the other. Though the, the little, little switch, which makes an entirely big difference. Clinically, uh, he's able to show that one of the major problems with sexual frustration is the excessive focus on the self and on experiencing pleasure, as opposed to uh, focusing on conferring pleasure on your partner. And what happens when you do that is that you're most successful. Again, I, I can make a moral argument for it, but what he does is make a practical argument for it. It works. This is the way life works. When you stop focusing on yourself excessively and you, you really shift to others, that's the whole idea of maturity, of, uh, of self-transcendence, of outer orientation, uh, of finding a meaning uh, in life by giving meaning to others. So, back again. The choices that we make uh, are choices based on our context. The, the most famous story in this, uh, in this regard is the one that Frankel tells of, uh, of a Jew who was stuck in a bunker in the First World War and cannons were coming and um, uh, the, uh, his supervising general in the saw that uh, this little Jewish guy was trembling, and he said to him, you see how much better we Aryans are than you? You are trembling, and look at me. I'm, you know, all the cannons are coming. I'm not moving at all. I'm fine. So I'm a lot better than you are. So he looked at him and said, yeah, you got it all wrong, he said. If you were as afraid as I am right now, you would have long ago run away. In other words, he was saying to him, really what you are is a coward. You don't get it. So you're not running away because you're a stupid guy. Uh, but I am fearful, but I'm still here. So the point of the matter is, he was saying, is uh, the choices that we make may not seem to be so dramatic. But in, in, his, in his galaxy, it's a totally different thing. Whether you are a doctor or a gas station attendant is, no, is not the point. Uh, if you are a doctor who doesn't care, who is very cold and callous, uh, you have squandered an opportunity that your profession has given to you to really give it and invest it with real meaning. If you're a gas station attendant who runs out of his way to uh, welcome people and put, not only put in the gas but ask them how they're feeling and wishing them a good day, what you've done is you've given meaning to your profession. What choice did you have? As a gas station attendant, you can't give them a penicillin shot. So you have no choice in that. But the measure of the person is not in the circumstances that dictate who they are or what they can do, but in what they do in those circumstances. 
which leads Frankel into a very interesting um, configuration with regard to values. We will to find meaning through the values that we actualize. What are those values? Those are, in his, in his understanding, there are three types. There's creative values. I would say that, for example, uh, a Van Gogh or a, um, um, or a Beethoven or uh, any of the great artists of our, uh, of our history, the things that they did were very creative, whether it was music, art, or whatever. Uh, those are creative values the things that we do to make other people's lives better. Then there's experiential values, which sometimes you have, uh, it's hard to explain it, but let's say you're going to a concert and uh, you hear, let's say, the music, let's say, of Ben Sion Shenko, Olova Shalom, and you're totally inspired. And when somebody says to you, does, does life have meaning now? That turns you on so much, you say, how could it not have meaning? Uh, the same thing can happen if you watch A Wonder of Nature and you say, what is it basically saying? Yes, God doesn't need our praises. We need to be able to praise God. And then we say, oh, yeah. So it, it, these intricacies, they sort of reinforce the idea that life has a purpose. There's something going on here that maybe I don't get it fully, but I get it enough. And then you have the final, which is the value of uh, attitude. And here Frankel is very clear. He says, there are times in our life when for whatever reason we can't be creative and even we can't even have experiences. But the idea of the attitude we take to the circumstances that we are in, this is precious. And it is of an estimable value. But remember how much it hinges. How much it hinges on this primary notion that he has that the striving to find the meaning in life is the most basic human expression. So in a situation where someone is, let's say, cooped up in a hospital with no hope of survival, but nevertheless doing things in terms of even their own attitude uh, to, um, to find a, a reason to go from one day to the other. You're not doing it as a technique. You're doing it because you really believe it. And because you really believe it, um, it, may, it changes things enormously. We, for example, uh, and, and by the way, when we're dealing with these values, they are of, infinite, uh, of an infinite type, which doesn't say, OK, if I can do this for five minutes, it's good. But if I only can do it for one minute, it's not. That's not the way it works. So think about this fascinating Jewish law, which goes like this. Um, you're allowed to, on Shabbos, intervene to save someone else's life, even if the blockage to you being able to do this is a transgression under normal circumstances. You're allowed to do so. One of the um, bases for this is the idea that you can halel alav Shabbat echad. I hate using the word this uh, to uh, desecrate the Shabbos. Halel is basically maybe to, to treat Shabbos as ordinary. You can treat Shabbos as ordinary on one day in order that they should be able to uh, fulfill later on many Shabbatot. So a simple question that is asked is what happens if this is only for a day or two? In other words, Yes, you will intervene now to save this person, but they're not going to last more than another day or two. Can you still do so? The answer is yes. But if the basis for it is that they're going to be able to observe other Shabbat experiences, that doesn't uh, exist in this, in this circumstance. So what is the basis for it? It's a fascinating insight, I think comes from Meiri, which says, in the time that they still have left after you have saved them, they can in their own minds mentally go over the times in their lives that they didn't keep Shabbat fully. And they can in, that, in those precious moments that they still have left, uh, basically do tshuva, change their minds and say, you know what, it was foolish of me to do that, I really feel badly. So in other words, 
what they have done is they've transformed previous Shabbat experiences into Shabbat fulfillments. So it may not be in the future, but it's in the past. It's fascinating insight. What happens is that the attitude that you take in the precious moments that you have can transform a life. And um, probably one of the most powerful um, stories that Frankel tells in, in many of his books is the story of his once visiting uh, San Quentin uh, Penitentiary, which is where hardened criminals were, were placed. And um, when he came, remember this is a fellow, whenever he went anywhere to speak, he usually was greeted by one and a half to 2,000 people. Uh, he goes there and uh, three people show up. So one of the people that showed up was the editor of the prison, uh, the prison newspaper. And he asks him, uh, how come nobody's here? Did you tell anybody that I was coming? He said, yeah, we let everybody know you were coming. And they said, what, a psychologist? No way. And why didn't they want to go? Because they said, we don't want to hear another time a psychologist saying to us, eh, you know, it's really unfair that you are here. You grew up in a slum. You had no parents to look after you. Uh, and therefore, you turned to a uh, criminal way. So they said, we are sick and tired of having a psychologist come to tell us it's not really you should be in prison, but your mother and your father who neglected you or the environment that you lived in. So we're sick of it. So we didn't show up. So Frankel understood this because this is really not what he was all about. But he says, OK, is it possible for me to speak to them directly? He said, yeah, we'll put you on the intercom. See, so they put him on intercom. So he's speaking now to the entire prison. And he's saying to them, you can imagine as a psychologist, he said, I know how you feel. One of the things that you never say to a person, right? Uh, even, God, God forbid, if a person is going through a harrowing experience, to say, I know how you feel is a, basically a real turnoff. How do you know how I feel? You're not me. And uh, it's, it's a statement, you, you have to be very careful how you say it. Uh, if, I know it comes out of a desire to be empathetic, but you gotta watch what you're saying. So here he is saying to everyone there, I know how you feel. What? This psychologist was once in prison? Nothing of the sort. He said, you guys are all on death row, right? You're convicted, your, your sentence is death, you're waiting for the, uh, for the potion. I know what it's like to be on death row. I was on death row. I was in the concentration camps. I, unlike you, I never had what you would call a sentence that was pronounced upon me. It came out of hate. But every day we woke up not knowing if this would be the last day of our life. And I know how it feels. And you know that there's limited time. And he said to them more or less something like this. You can spend the rest of your life thinking that this was not your fault, that you had nothing to do with it, but I am telling you that it's more important for you to at these last days of your life think in terms of if I am here because I'm guilty, to take this guilt upon myself and to use it not to weigh down upon you, but to grow from it. This is one of the wonderful things about uh, what Frankel takes these negative impulses and turns them into positive. You don't have to uh, think about this as diminishing yourself. As a matter of fact, his mentor philosophically was Max Shaler, who really turned guilt on its head and said, if you tell individuals, no matter what they do, that it's not their fault, uh, it's not their responsibility, basically what you're telling them is that they don't matter, that everything that's happening around them is out of their control, they have no say in it, and it's crazy what you're basically saying, you're denuding them of all their human responsibilities. He said, on the contrary, he said, man has a right, listen to this, man has a right to be considered guilty. Because the moment you take away from him that sense of guilt, you lame his will to change. You denude him of all sense of responsibility. It's a horrible thing to do. But this is what we're doing in our generation, not your fault, and you know what? If you fail, it's because a teacher is not a good teacher. 
Uh, and then we have to make believe that you really didn't fail because it's going to dent your self-esteem. So we'll do all the stuff to make believe that you really passed and uh, we're going to have pass-fail rather than grades. This entire world that we're dealing with, we're coddling a generation which has not been reared with the idea that, yeah, you did it, you're guilty, it's a good thing, own up and change. Doesn't happen. So he said to them, own up in the last days of your life. Think about how you can, if only within your own self, repent and regret the things that you did. Relive it and, and do things differently now and, and be remorseful. And it made a difference. The, uh, the fellow that, that was there with him in the room was the editor of the thing, wrote, wrote a piece about this experience which one, I didn't know, uh, there's, a, there's a prisoner's uh, newspaper best article of the year award. Doesn't, this doesn't compare with the Pulitzer, but it's close, right? And this guy won the award for telling the story about Viktor Frankl's experience. What he was doing was basically enunciating what we know all the time, shuv yom echol lifnei misoschot, to repent one day before you die. Of course, you never know the day that you're gonna die, so since we may not be here tomorrow, we should spend the day in tshuva. Now, the word tshuva may sound a little bit heavy. What it means, in simple terms, is to get better, to improve. Uh, we, we can use the heavy-handed words such as repent from your sins, but it really means whatever you're doing today, do tomorrow better. Whatever you did yesterday, today you're going to do a little bit better. It means growing as a human being uh, but growing means that you realize that, like every human being, we're deficient. And he was basically trying to take all of these negative ideas uh, and make them into positives. So suffering and death, for example, those are two negatives. He turns them on their head. He very carefully avoids the idea of suggesting that it's good to suffer, it, that it's good to um, uh, that it's good to die. He doesn't say that, but he says the fact of suffering is very important for human beings. Think about a situation where a person goes through an entire life uh, unimpeded, everything is you know hunky dory, uh, and uh, there's no point in time where he has to wake up to the idea of you know maybe life is not just a bowl of cherries with cream on top. Maybe there are challenges. The truth of the matter is that you cannot go through life without suffering. It's impossible to do that. And our, but, but basically Frankl says, what do you do in this situation of suffering is to try to grow from it, uh, to use that suffering situation as a message to tell you, okay, I, I, have, uh, I have this confronting me. Will I become a better person because of it? One of the things that has impressed me in my life as a rabbi, um, and I say this with great trepidation because um, I don't want you to think that, that I've gone off my, off my mind, but I have met very, very often people who are struggling with cancer. Cancer is a scorch. Um, we know that it hits uh, close to one out of two people during their lifetime. It's one of the prices that we pay for living long. Uh, but what I found fascinating, and sometimes I've, I'm totally astounded with people who beforehand had been totally narcissistic. Uh, everything was about having a good breakfast, then going for a golf game, uh, then having a rest in the afternoon, then going uh, for supper and movies. And, Life was just about luxury and cruises and vacations and everything like that. And then all of a sudden, this gigantic albatross gets uh, way down upon them. And you figure this is going to be devastating. And what you hear sometimes is that somehow or other, this cancer has woken them up to what life is all about. Um, it's, it's almost like a near-death experience that people have when, for example, they, they need uh, an organ transplant or something like that, or they actually almost die and then they are saved, realize that life is a gift. Truth of the matter is that life is a gift even before that, but it's the realization that comes with a thud. 
And they, they realize now that all that stuff was garbage, that it was meaningless. Um, it took this for that to happen because all, all the drushes that were given on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur during the year didn't make a difference. But that experience wakens it up to the fact that there's more to life than just the joyride. And so these people then get transformed from what's in it for me to what can I do to help the world. And uh, they make up their mind that if they survive, they're going to volunteer to do simple things like maybe being in a hospital uh, to help people, uh, <clears throat> menial tasks that they would have dreamt of beforehand. And they on their own say that, if, I, I don't ask them the question, but they on their own volunteer that I am happy that I got the cancer. It's a very astounding thing to hear because all of a sudden what happens is they now find that they have a meaning in their life. They were living thinking, oh, this is what life is all about. Turns out there was Narishkeit. That's not what life was all about at all. And this is Frankel coming to the fore. Death, the idea. He says, that's not a positive, <clears throat> but think about what would happen if we'd live forever. We could always say, oh, okay, I'm gonna live forever, so I don't have to do anything today because there's always gonna be a tomorrow. So look how his mind works. He takes what everyone thinks is a negative and he puts a positive spin on it and says, if we didn't have the fact of death, we could always delay. Always delaying means that you're never fulfilling. So the idea that we have a finite existence is absolutely crucial for a meaningful life. This is all, we, you see how this all builds from that one simple little premise. That one simple premise goes out in all directions. Firstly, a word that you um, didn't hear him say, but it's actually implicit in all this, is that famous word, hope. So when you talk about people are dealing in, in concentration camp situations who have a task for them, it's, it's basically a hope for a future that's coming through. But he did get into trouble with this because there were out, a lot of people who were out for his, uh, for his skin, maybe more than his skin who uh, basically said, see, I told you, this guy is loony, because we know that who, you su who survived in the concentration camp had nothing to do with meaning. It had to do with, uh, it, it was totally random. Uh, a guard saw you, didn't like the way you looked at him, he shot you. Uh, you know, you go left, go right. Who had control over that stuff? So there were basically some who attacked him bitterly and said that what he's saying is totally nonsense. And he kept on saying it, in spite of all the people who naysayed and said, you're, you're talking uh, stuff which is drivel. What was his argument? He was very careful. Maybe we have to put in a little word, which is that um, given the same circumstance, people who had a meaning orientation would be more likely to survive. It had nothing. This is not to say that with all the meaning that you could get shot uh, just the moment you woke up or even in your sleep. The point that he's making is in so far as you take two individuals in the exact same circumstances, having that meaning is very important in, the, in terms of a, being able to make it. We see this all the time. We see this all the time in terms of people who are wrestling with illnesses, who uh, some of them give up and say, what's it all about? And there's no reason to fight anymore. And others who we try to say, you know, you have so much to live for. And sometimes you have to change it out and say, not so much what you have to live for, but how much your grandchildren want you to be at the bar mitzvah. Or your grandchildren want to be there when you're doing the wedding. Uh, is it a trick? No, this is, we're trying to give people a sense of something to fight for that is, that is worth it. And then there's this interesting thing that he mentioned about suicide, uh, that uh, he had that famous encounter in the camps. For you to know in the background, uh, and he uh, writes about this, and it's in one of the um, books written about Frankel, one of the greatest, the things that gave him the greatest pride was when he was um, put in charge of the polyclinic in Vienna, uh, at that point in time, the suicide rate in, in Vienna had gone sky high. And what he did was intervene as much as, he po as possible 
And he said he took great pride in the fact that in his watch, nobody ever committed suicide. This is what drove him there. He was a young guy then. And uh, this is, for him, be, being able to convince. Like, suicidal people are the ones who think that there's nothing left for them in this world. For him to be able to do this on an individual basis is something that, uh, that he was adept at and he was passionate about uh, to make sure that it didn't happen. He considers it to be a total failure on his part if he couldn't help doing this. And then I, I think I'm pretty sure that I told you this story last, week, last time, but uh, for you who have never been here before, there's this classic story that, um, uh, that was told. It couldn't happen today because today, does anybody have the telephone number of a celebrity? You don't. But in those days, uh, Victor Frankl got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, from a woman who was on, I don't even know how this, she's contemplating suicide. I could make, I could dr dramatize it by saying she was on the bridge ready to jump, but they didn't have cell phones then, <laughs> so that wouldn't work. Uh, but the story was she, she called Frankl and she was bent on committing suicide and Frankl gave her this argument, that argument, didn't accept any of it. And uh, after a half an hour on the phone, she um, hung up and ha he had no idea what the end of this would be. And then a few days later, um, he's in his office at the Plotty Clinic and they tell him there's a lady here to see him. Don't know why. And again, this doesn't happen today. You got her through seven secretaries before you get to the guy. Anyway. He came, she came in and said, uh, Dr. Frankl, you don't know me. Uh, but you remember a few days ago, a lady uh, called you in the, morning, in the middle of the night, and uh, that was me. So Frankl, ever the scientist, said, yeah, I know, you wanted to commit suicide, and I told you this, that, or the other, and what convinced you not to? So she looked at him and said, nothing. So then the next question is, okay, then why didn't you jump? His, her answer was a classic. She said, there was no argument that you told me that convinced me not to, convince, to commit suicide. What convinced me to commit suicide was the fact that you, at 3 o'clock in the morning, took the phone, did not complain that, you woke, that I woke you up, and took a half an hour to, to argue with me to save my life. That in itself convinced me that my life was worth saving, that there's such goodness in the world. So we don't have to have techniques all the time about things. Just doing the right thing, doing the meaningful thing, doing the appropriate thing in itself is more affirming than saying, hey, you know, you really are a good guy. Uh, but rather, you know, in terms of get them oriented towards something that will give them this sense. One of the magical things that works, let's say, with people who have, uh, you know, a, a really down feeling about themselves is to give them a task say, this is the thing you're going to do. The cults, ex they, they excel in this. They take people who are down and out, and they give them you know, a broom and say, your job is to clean the floor. And they think, you know, now, now life has a meaning. Shtus, that's what it is. Nonsense. We have so, much, so many better things that we can give to individuals uh, to give them a sense that life, at least they're making a difference. But the main, and, and again, critical, I come back to that over and over again. What Frankel does in almost all of these situations is shift the focus away from me. Because the moment you start fixating on yourself, you're in a really down spiral. It doesn't mean that you, you don't spend time thinking about what is my best vocation, what is the best thing that I can excel at. But after that, you, you say, OK, but now my life is a life of giving. And you're not making sacrifices by it. That's the irony of it. That's the paradox of life, which uh, leads to a, one of these very interesting techniques that Frankl has, which is paradoxical intention, where you intend the very thing that you're trying to avoid. So when I, when I came in here this morning, so uh, one of the people who are here, one who made the long trip from Montreal, we were talking about how life is full of stress. And uh, one, of the re one of the biggest stressors in life, believe it or not, is your focus on yourself. And you're saying, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that, this is coming, that's coming. Instead of just saying, okay, I'll take them one at a time, simple little thing, 
and I'll focus on what has to be. So how does Frankel, for example, deal with stress? I, I took Frankel's um, principles and, put, and, and I put them to work in, uh, in rabbinic life. Uh, I'll give you two examples. After that, I'll stop and we'll open it up to questions. Uh, that's okay? That's good? Okay. Number one, the typical bar mitzvah boy. Nervous about how he's going to do in front of a crowd. So I take this famous thing from Viktor Frankl. He says, how does he, um, he, he had a person who came to him because he was afraid of public speaking because he would do knee knocking. So of course, uh, the worst thing you'd say to them is, don't knock your knees, you'll be okay. He basically turned around and said, you know what, I got an idea for you. Since you're doing knee knocking, we can actually make this into an opportunity for you to set the knee knocking per, per minute record in human history. So I want you, when you come up there, you go up and you make up your mind that you're gonna knock your knees as much as you can as you're speaking. It's a joke, right? But it stopped it. Where did he get, he says this famous thing, he tells a story of a high school where uh, there was a play in which one of the parts was to uh, stutter. So there was a kid in the class who stuttered. So they gave him this part in the play. Uh, no brainer, right? He called for stuttering. He's a guy who stutters all the time, fine. When he was put on stage and tried to stutter, he couldn't. Because now he was making his mind to stutter and he couldn't do it. So how does this translate, you know? So when, when, you have, when you're fighting is when you have the problem. So if you're ever having difficulty sleeping, don't fight it, welcome it. So, what do you, so there's a, there are different techniques, but if you, in, when you're finding that you can't sleep, you make up your mind you're gonna stay awake as opposed to trying more and more to fall asleep, you're gonna be more successful in falling asleep. But you, but you have to be careful, how, you have to be honest with yourself as you do it. So, the, so uh, bar mitzvah boys who are nervous, I tell them that's great. Just be as nervous as you can. Enjoy it because you're never gonna have such an opportunity to be as nervous as you will at your bar mitzvah. It's a great thing. And it, it sounds crazy, but it works. So that was, Paradoxical intention. What did I tell them I was going to do? Paradoxical tension, and then what? I forgot. Question. Was that it? Okay, so, okay, I'm done. Okay, so thank you very much. Paradoxical tension, in other words, all of life's a paradox. Thank you very much.